Good evening, I'm Darcy. And I'm Hannah. Welcome to Real Bites. The podcast where we, as film students, put our limited coherent thoughts into words to discuss classic films. In this episode, we'll be discussing the 1968 film The Party, directed by Blake Edwards and starring Peter Sellers and Claudine Langer. Stay tuned for our thoughts on foam, elephants as political billboards, and Elvis Presley's taste in film. Also, keep in mind, we discussed the plot and the characters and everything, so there will be spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film and you want to see it first, go do that. <laughs> so this mm-hmm. is a film about an Indian actor who, while acting on a Hollywood production, messes up big time. And as kind of a clerical error, instead of getting blacklisted, gets invited to a party. So Hannah, you chose this film. Can you tell us a bit about why you chose it? Basically, I was with my dad one day, and he said, have you ever seen this movie? It's, like, really funny. And then we watched, like, the first couple minutes together, and then I had to go, but I thought, Mm. hey, this is funny. Why not watch the whole thing? Yeah, it's not a very well-known film. I mean, it was probably around his era or time period, so... I guess it isn't very popular now. This narrative is structured in a fish-out-of-water way, where we get to see Bakshi both at home, where he's more comfortable, and we get to all see him on set causing chaos, and then at, at the party, which is where the grand majority of the film takes place, and he's very out of his element. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically the whole film is about him wandering around and doing stupid stuff and messing everything up. Yeah, oh, he man. intentionally yet methodically messes with every single aspect of the party. <laughs> There's no, like, if it can go plot. wrong, he makes it go wrong. Exactly. He just, it's like, how can we cause trouble in this part of the house? And that's how every scene kind of plays out. It's quite a slow film. Yeah, there, there's no real objective. It's like, we know he's there because we accidentally got invited, but that's it. Yeah, he, he just he doesn't know what he wants. So. And I mean, no one kicks him out either, which... I guess they were drunk. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of plot structure, I realize how whenever Bakshi does something stupid, he goes back to the pool, <laughs> which is this part of the house where... it's. I think it's the central part of the house. The pool? Uh, yeah, I think so. There's there's water throughout the whole house. There's oh, yeah. Does an indoor he, pool that connect... flows out to the outdoor pool, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a nice house. Actually, the inside of the mansion was a massive indoor movie set, and it was built at the Lot Studio in West Hollywood. Wow. It's pretty fancy. They made it very high-tech, which is... It, it would have been unusual for houses in 1968. Yeah. And I suppose that's part of where, you know, the inspiration from they got from James Bond films and sci-fi films of the time, because you see this high-tech thing also in Get Smart. Oh, yeah. It was made around the same time, right? Like the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, that's a good And they also have sliding doors and stuff. Yeah. I mean, they used it really well for, like, just comedic purposes when he just, like, presses whatever switch, whatever chaos ensues, just... Everything just kind of goes downhill. <laughs> that, too, I, I found, as someone who watches a lot of Rowan Atkinson's comedy stuff, like films and stand-up comedy, I saw some similarities between this, the intercom scene and the scene in Johnny English, where Rowan Atkinson's character presses a button in the villain's house and then starts talking about his plan, and which is broadcast to the whole house. And there's <laughs> something similar in here, when Bakshi presses the button and talks into it and again it's broadcast mm-hmm. to the whole house Burgeon of course he's talking one. nonsense but <laughs> it's the same concept that's a good that's a really good connection there was some great characters in there there's that cowboy actor what was his name the cowboy the wyoming bill oh oh the guy who plays billiards yeah cool he's With so unhelpful though <laughs> when actually falls into the pool the guy just like stands there and does nothing and yells at people for help when he's supposed to be this great character exactly really funny 
And there were some elements where I expected stuff, but I didn't get stuff. Like, I thought when he was, there's one scene with the toilet, right? Where he's flushing the toilet for some reason. He got, he gets like paper towel stuffed in there. Oh, yeah. It keeps flushing and he can't turn it off. And he leans over it and he's wearing this hugely exaggerated tie in that scene. And I was expecting the toilet, the, the tie to get sucked down into the toilet, but that didn't happen. I feel like that would have been the end of the character. <laughs> it's not that kind of movie. But I thought that would happen too, because the tie was uh-huh. literally just dangling, like so yeah. close to it. And that's another thing from Johnny English, where again, <laughs> Rowan Atkinson's character get, gets his tie stuck in a little, like moving strip, on the table in a, like a sushi restaurant. Yeah. What did you think of um, the main character? I forgot. I I I, I, I kind of feel bad for him the whole time. Like, like, what are you doing, my friend? Like, from one point of view, he's trying his best to fit in, but from another, he does all these unnecessary unnecessary things. Like, he's amusing himself, but at what cost? Exactly. I mean, right off off the bat, when his shoe fell off. When he first enters the mansion, I was like, oh yeah. god, it's this guy. And the way he goes about trying to fix the issue. It's just easier to get his shoe, but he goes through this whole thing of hiding behind some plants. And <laughs> it's like get, almost making frustrating. Making it even worse, yeah. You know? It's like, it's funny, but it's But he doesn't seem to care. He's not, like, agitated by anything. <laughs> He's just completely neutral <laughs> about the whole thing, which is where, what makes it funny. He's like, Oh, my shoe fell off, so I'm just gonna it's like it's fine, I'm fine, I'm just gonna act weird with a little, little smile on my face and I'm gonna get my shoe back the weirdest way possible. Like no one noticed either. Yeah. He doesn't really seem that affected by anything. He just he just <laughs> goes with the flow. I like when I was first saw the film, first of all I expected the actor to be a woman for some reason, like the main character. <laughs> I know, I thought that would be really funny, so that's what I expected. And I saw it was a guy, I was like, okay. But then, you know, I kind of think it would have been funnier if he'd actually been Indian. I think so, too, because, I mean, the whole point is him trying to adapt to Western ways. And again, it goes back to, like, the fish-out-of-water idea. It's just funny, because, like, at some points you can see the face paint, like, running. Yeah, he gets wet so many times. (laughs) And he has these light eyes and... Yeah. I mean, no, some people have light eyes, but mm, yeah, you it can just tell. doesn't look real. I mean, his poor makeup artist probably just running around with like the paint. <laughs> like how does the the nineties, sixties? Because you do get like brown face and get smart as well. I think yeah, they were like, well, true. we need diversity, but not that kind. <laughs> not that kind. Which I find <laughs> odd. Like, just get someone, you know. I read a fun fact somewhere. That the president of India at the time <laughs> wasn't even offended. He just really liked the movie, especially the line where Peter gets yelled at and then he says, In India, we don't think who we are, we know who we are. After the guy asks him, Do you know who you are? I noticed the there's a scene with the elephant where the hostess's daughter brings in an elephant painted in political statements. And then they parade the elephant around the party. And so I noticed that the elephant's handler was always the guy in front with carrying, pulling the little rope. And he was so <laughs> hyper-focused on the elephant and like pushing people out of the way. It's You could definitely tell he was not as undercover as he thought he was. <laughs> you know, I didn't even notice that. I was just like focused oh, really? on the really? slogans. I was trying yeah, to there was this guy who was like significantly older than them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Mom, look at my 15 friends and this one old dude dragging the elephant around. <laughs> I I looked up pictures of what was written on the elephant, and on its forehead it says, The world is flat. Oh. Boss, love is a sugar cube, and run naked <laughs> written on the bum of the elephant. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, ha- I don't know what these mean. If we were hippies in the 1960s, we would know. Me neither. Oh, there was also Socrates eats hemlock on it. I don't know what that means either. The poor elephant. According to Wikipedia, those are hippie slogans. 
So if it was in okay. the 60s, then that makes sense. Yeah, just that to us. Nothing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you could, well, you could tell from the plot. I could tell they were hippie slogans. I just don't get the... It's still funny, though. And there's some parts where the actors almost corpsed. I could see when the hostess was upstairs doing her hair in rollers and then she goes outside, falls into the pool, comes back. There's this guy who's doing her hair for her <laughs> and he's like following her and he, I, I can tell he's trying not to laugh. <laughs> that lady, so, her acting was so good. I know. Yeah. And I mean, after she fell into the pool for the third time, I, I was just laughing so much. But there was like a slight continuity issue after one of the times when she was wearing the blue dress. Oh, is that Right so? after she like, falls into the pool with her purple dress. She falls into the pool with her blue dress, right? And then on the way back up the stairs, it's dry again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but her hair is wet in the rollers. Yeah, that's a good yeah. chance. But okay. about her acting was really funny. Okay, oh, you forgot to say the part about the, the vodka. Yeah, at one point there was some Russian guests who showed up at the party. The dancers, yeah. Yeah, the dancers. They did... I didn't hear any proper Russian. I just heard them shouting vodka over and over again, <laughs> randomly. The cultural stereotypes in this film <laughs> on are, point. They were not spared. They spared <laughs> no expense with the c- cultural stereotypes. <laughs> what first stood out to me was the fact the title credits are eight minutes into the film. Yeah. So you get a good view of what the film is going to be about by then. Style, I really liked the set and costume design. Uh-huh. I thought it was just really well. You kind of like I felt like I was there. Like a yeah, really fancy. Yeah, especially the house. Yeah. Like with all the paintings and mm-hmm. like what's it called? Um What kind of furniture? Like how what's the word for that kind of furniture? Like modern art? Modern <laughs> art, yeah. Well, modern for the 60s. And the the costumes like all the dresses that people were wearing at the party and, like, everyone was in suits. Like, it was... It felt pretty real. They had the... They kept the extras to a minimum. And I liked how I could see the same people in, in every scene. And you yeah. could kind of follow along with their stories as well, like, what's going on in their It lives. was nice when you could get, like, wide shots of everyone dancing for a while. Yeah. Because you can kind of look at each character and they're all doing something different. Yeah, that's like the cowboy guy and then the French girl and the producers. Yeah. Or that one lady who just kept drinking and drinking and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> and the waiter. Oh, the, the waiter. waiter. Okay, yeah. can we talk about the ra- my favorite character? Sure, let's talk about the, the waiter. I mean, he really didn't do much. Like, all, if if a guest didn't take their drink, he'd, he'd drink it instead. And then, like, halfway through the film, he's, like, pretty drunk, but he still has to go around and, like, serve people. Yeah, it's, it's progressively really drunker. <laughs> At the end, he just drowns in foam, yeah. <laughs> trying to get more alcohol. So the film, aside from the final scene, which is the foam scene where the whole house fills up with foam <laughs> yeah. after Bakshi forces them to wash the elephant for being offensive to like the elephant, <laughs> like painting him the wrong way. So after that, the house fills with foam. Is aside from that final part. The movie is so slow, and it's it very is. quiet for a comedy. I mean, quiet and, like, there's, like, that little really smooth jazz, like, background music playing the whole time. The acting is very calm as well from the main character. That's so true. Going about yeah. his day, very calm, and it's like, oh, something's going wrong. He's going to fix it in a weird way, but he's still calm. Well, yeah. And, like, I feel like it felt that slow also because, you, like, he didn't really have an objective again. Like, yeah. this is one of those films where there's no real goal for the protagonist. Nothing could have prepared me for, like, the foam scene. That, that like, that was a... <laughs> that was great. Compared to the rest of the film, it was loud and crazy. They kept it to one location. and One extravagant location. That's true, and it shows you can base a story on a really neat location. Even though this yeah. was, as you mentioned, fake. Yeah, the focus of each shot is always on Peter Seller. But I liked how a lot of it was, like, wide shots. So even though he's moving really slow, like, it gave you time to look around the scene and, like, look at the art on the wall or, like, some weird statue or something. Yeah, it was kind of like, the composition was kind of like paintings in many, at many times, where you could get the whole story in a single frame. 
like the whole comic. Yeah. It was better than any close-ups because all the close-ups looked awful because you could see the makeup on his face. Yeah. And it was just oh, that's also true. There's a, um some difficult shots as well to achieve in terms of an acting standpoint. There's one where he runs and then he's he's at you know when you run and you kind of slow down and you kind of stumble at the end. Yeah. He did that across a pool on the tiny little islands of the pool. Oh, those little marble That's steps. so difficult, yeah. Because they, you have to step exactly on each one. And he did it fast. Oh, yeah. You know? And then if he fell, then he'd have to get dry again and get a new Exactly, that's what I thought. Like, get his oh, makeup my. done and everything. So. Oh, my goodness. I was just wondering how many times they tried that shot, because it was insane. <laughs> I see you listed some funny dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about your favorite dialogue parts. <laughs> So, first piece of dialogue is when uh, Bakshi is staring at Wyoming Bill as he plays billiards with that girl. Very intimately, I might add. <laughs> that was so unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unnecessarily intimate. <laughs> but it, it gets even weirder the way Bakshi <laughs> just watches them. He just, like, stares at them. So then Bill notices Bakshi staring at him. Bakshi's like, oh, pay no attention to me, sir. I'm just merely spectating. He has a, he has a very pre- the character has a very precise grasp of language, and later on he he has like some quotes ready and stuff. Um, I like his clothes. Wyoming. He he has a he has a very snazzy outfit. He's got style. Okay, do you want to be Bakshi for this one? Sure. There's a scene where Bakshi is comforting Michelle on the bed after she gets wet in a pool and then has to change her dress. She's very upset, and he goes, Wisdom is the province of the aged, but the heart of a child is pure. That's very and then pretty. Michelle goes, oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. sorry. And then Michelle goes, That's very pretty. I'm not sure I know what it means. And Bakshi replies with, Well, neither do I. Looking at the quote, it is a very weird quote. One of the funniest quotes is again at the very beginning, where the director, or basically Bakshi, accidentally blows up a huge castle while the camera still isn't rolling and the director gets really angry because then they have to rebuild the set yeah so the director's like get out off the picture you're washed up you're finished and i'll see to it that you never make another movie and bakshi goes does that include television sir relentlessly optimistic but he does realize he's kind of being an asshole because when the director chases him he runs yeah <laughs> Oh, I think another... he has some idea of the chaos he caused. I mean, it doesn't seem to bug him anyway. Another iconic line is by Levinson, which is the waiter, who keeps going to Bakshi and trying to offer him alcohol, even though Bakshi keeps telling him repeatedly that he doesn't drink. Yeah. So the line is, vodka or scotch? And yeah. then Bakshi obviously goes, I don't drink. So then Levinson turns around and just drinks it himself. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, Bakshi's also responsible for getting Levinson drunk. <laughs> I didn't know he had a nice. name. Good, nice find that the actor has a name, the character. I love him. Uh, <laughs> That's a good waiter name. And of course, there's the iconic, iconic lines where Bakshi plays with a parrot. He feeds wanna... the parrot. So first, Fred stares at Bakshi as he's feeding the parrot. So he just looks at him and says, she's having the birdie num nums. And then we hear birdie num num repeatedly like throughout the film so i think if you say birdie num num around anyone who's like 50 or 60 they'll probably know what you're talking about yeah this is probably the most the catchiest line of the film yeah we have some fun facts now some of them are actually sad facts but that's okay (laughs) so the first one is uh the film was released on april 4th 1968 which happened to be the exact same day that Martin Luther King was assassinated, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I I hadn't thought of that. I just read it somewhere. Good Googling, like, yeah, as well. Yeah. So yeah. on IMDb, it says this was one of Elvis Presley's favorite films. And I can't help thinking, if this is the case, he didn't have very good taste. Oh. <laughs> I mean, not for a favorite film. I, I like this film, but, you know, it's not a favorite film. Not a favorite, favorite, I agree. No. Oh, the score of the party was composed by Henry Mancini, and 
He commented on the audience's reactions when they screened the film. He says, that's what I get for writing a nice song for a comedy. Nobody's going to hear a note of it because everyone's yeah. just laughing. And they can't hear the score. But the score was nice. It was just like relaxing elevator music, classy yeah. dinner party style. It connected the whole film. It kind of ran yeah. through as a reoccurring theme. Yeah. So the original script, apparently, it was only about 60, 63 pages in length. And so the majority of the content was improvised. and Like on set. Yeah. So if you have good comedians... And you can afford to spend a lot of time on set without a strict schedule. Then I, I guess like it works. But if you have dream. a yeah, if you have a strict schedule and stuff, then there's no room for improvisation. Damn. And often a, a good script comes. But I suppose but I mean, like, that's works. part of making a good comedy. I don't know. An element of spon- spontaneity. <laughs> spontaneity. I know, like, for some comedy films, I know they have very detailed scripts, like A Fish Called Wanda. Storyboarding, like, every single shot. Yeah. So it's, like, kind of cool to watch a film that, like, approaches it from another perspective. I haven't heard of many films which have been improvised. It's risky. Usually it's kind of frowned upon. You think anyone actually accidentally fell in the pool and then they were like, hey... Just hey, <laughs> hold. I think that would take that. pre-planning because you need multiple copies and dry costumes and a place to change the. Action. Yeah, all I could think about, like when everyone was in the water, I was like, imagine you have all these extras who are just wet and covered in foam, and like mm. as soon as you click cut, you gotta get all these like towels and warm people up. Speaking of the foam, I read somewhere how it was like fire fighting foam. So it was fire retardant, and <laughs> someone fell in, the stuntman pushed a producer in or something, and the producer nearly died because the foam like, took the oxygen out of his body or something. But yeah, I don't think cool. that's true, because, or at least not all of it, because you have multiple people in the foam. Like, yeah, all the actors are like swimming around in it. <laughs> yeah, I guess this was the 60s, but I don't, I don't really believe that. I don't think I mean, that, what did, what did they that was that's reasonable. Again, yeah, I'm wondering that too, but... I've seen, have you, you know, have you ever seen, like, amusement parks where they have, they they just make a lot of foam and people just, like, walk around in it? Oh, no, I haven't seen, but sure. They might have used the same substance. I don't know what it's called, but, yeah. Yeah, it's foam like is a hard thing foam. to deal with. And, I mean, they turn on the AC, right, to, like, kind of disperse the foam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what he thinking? saves the paintings, the husband saves the paintings. <laughs> Like, he's like, no, himself. not that one. That was ugly. Save the better <laughs> one. <laughs> what were you saying about something else? Dispersing? Oh, that reminds me. I like the part where the musicians playing all the dinner music. The foam just like slowly creeps yeah. in on them. And they just play their instruments they like it's playing. nothing. Like, like on the Titanic. <laughs> you know, they're like, the musicians played until like it sank. Oh my gosh. They're very devoted. Do you think the comedy of the film has aged? Do you still find it funny? Yeah, I thought it was funny. I enjoyed it. Did you? I enjoyed most of it. It is a bit slower. Like, compared (laughs) to Get Smart or um, James Bond, like, it is a lot slower. Because I know some films age. They don't age well. (laughs) I'm thinking of, like, Entourage, even though it was made... I think it was made in probably the early 2000s. It's okay. just, it's so bad. I can't, I can't watch it anymore. And other <laughs> films like Diner, which are supposed, supposedly classics in American graffiti, they've aged, and I don't find them funny. You don't need much context to understand it. I feel like anyone who watches it can laugh. Yeah. Like, no matter that, how old you are, no, either. Not a lot of social references. Yeah, I like the way you put it. Okay, shall we wrap it up? Yeah, okay. Well, that pretty much sums up the party. You've been listening to Real Bites, the podcast where we discuss classic films in bite-sized episodes. This podcast is free to listen to, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, TikTok, and more. Find all the links at realbites.card.co, which is spelled R-E-E-L-B-I-T-E-S dot C-A-R-R-D dot C-O.
Thank you for listening. 